Now today we're going to look together at Psalms 9 and 10 and we're going to take them together because uh, in some of the old manuscripts they were one psalm. So I'm going to suggest at this point that you pause the video. I will count to five um, and then continue speaking. But if you pause the video uh, and read through Psalms 9 and 10 because at no point am I actually going to be reading the psalms through with you. So pause the video now and read Psalms 9 and 10. Okay, let's uh, have a look at this together then. So in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, in the Latin Vulgate, which comes out in the 5th century, that's um, uh, Jerome's translation of it, Four of the Hebrew manuscripts, and in the tradition of the Roman Catholic Church, these two Psalms, 9 and 10, go together. Also, we find Psalms 42 and 43 uh, run together. However, if you're reading the Masoretic text, which is the Hebrew text, the Peshitta, which is the Syriac, or the Targum, which is the Aramaic version, or any of the, um, uh, the English uh, and Protestant traditions you'll find that it, it appears as two psalms I, i'm with those who say that it's one psalm and i'm going to explain that to you so that's the first thing i'm going to do uh, and you'll find that this particular vlog is, is quite a bit different there's uh, a lot more sort of content background information but it will be practical as well i promise you first of all then the the superscription the title of psalm 9 says to the tune of the death of the sun so we could be back in Absalom territory here. There are 12 Psalms where we find a tune mentioned, uh, but only five tunes. So the, the different tunes are the, the one I've just mentioned, uh, the Doe of the Morning, then the Lilies or the Lilies of the Covenant, that appears about four times, a Dove on Distant Oaks, and also Do Not Destroy, four times that turns up as well, and possibly Psalm 88, which is the suffering of affliction. But we don't know at all what they sound like no copies of the music another way of translating to the tune of the death of the sun um, could be to suggest that it was written for young voices for boys to sing for uh, high trebles if you like another reason for suggesting the two should run together is there's no superscription no title above psalm 10 um, and from psalms 3 through to 42 the only other one that's like that is um, Psalm 33. So there's a su suggestion that 9 and 10 were originally written as one psalm. Also, Psalm uh, 9 ends with the word selah, which I've said is like time out or a musical notation, time of reflection. And nowhere else, nowhere else in the Psalms does a psalm end with selah, which suggests that this one shouldn't uh, either, anticipates continuation. This is an acrostic, so that the first letters of um, different verses run through the Hebrew alphabet. We find that particularly in Psalm uh, 119, where you get eight verses uh, and there are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. So you get 176 verses and each of them starts with the successive letter in the Hebrew alphabet. A number of these psalms work like that. Psalm 145 is an acrostic as well. Uh, and I remember someone coming speaking once and saying, this psalm uh, is the missing nun. And everyone looking blank. But the letter N, nun or nun in the Hebrew, doesn't appear in that particular um, acrostic. So they said it's the missing nun. And this particular one uh, runs through from the Hebrew letters um, A to, to K in Psalm 9 and then starts again with the letter L in Psalm 10, which again suggests that it's um, that's the way it runs. They, there's a few letters missed out, so it's a little bit broken, bits of it could be missing, or it could be that the subject matter itself is so um, fractured that at times, you, you know, you don't want a, a happy um, rhythm to it. You want to break it up to suggest that something sad and bad is, is sort of happening there. So every two verses in Psalm 9, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, and then you miss out Dalet, that's missing, then it goes on to Hay, and it comes all the way up to what should be Calf in the last yeah, um, pairs of, pair of verses, verses 19 and 20 in Psalm 9. 
and instead that is cough instead of calf calf doesn't appear you get two coughs which you know you, you don't want do you you don't want a couple of coughs in, in these days so you get an extra cough there and it's interesting that the the two verses that uh, start with the hebrew letter cough it's like a q or a, a k or a, a hard c um also when you pick that up in psalm 10 start the same way so it, in both of them it's saying arise o lord so there's obviously parallels there um <clears throat> many of the phrases are paralleled in psalms 9 and 10 so um i'm going to read to you um bits of psalm 9 and then I'm going to read to you sections from Psalm 10. You can see how they parallel each other. So in Psalm 9, verse 9, the Lord is a stronghold in times of trouble. And then in Psalm 10, verse 1, why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? Psalm 9, verse 12, he does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Psalm 10, verse 11, he says to himself, God has forgotten Psalm 9, verse 15, their feet are caught in the net they have hidden. Psalm 10, verse 9, he catches the helpless and drags them off in his net. Psalm 9, verse 12, he does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Verse 12 of Psalm 10, do not forget the cry of the afflicted. Psalm 9, verse 12, he who avenges blood remembers. Psalm 10, verse 13, why does the wicked man say to himself, he won't avenge? Psalm 9, verses 9 and 10. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. Those who know your name will trust in you, for you have never abandoned those who seek you. Psalm 10, verse 14. The victim abandons himself to you. You are the father of the fatherless. Psalm 9, verse 7. The Lord reigns forever. Psalm 10, verse 16, the Lord is king forever and ever. Psalm 9, verse 5, you have rebuked the nations. The memory of them has perished. Psalm 10, the nations will perish from his land. Psalm 9, verse 18, nor the hope of the afflicted ever perish. Psalm 10, verses 16 and 17, you hear, O Lord, the desire of of the afflicted and psalm 9 verses 8 and 9 he will judge the world in righteousness the lord is a refuge for the oppressed verses 8 and 9 and that particular verse is picked up in acts 17 isn't it and then psalm 10 verse 18 judging the fatherless and the oppressed um, so you get the power you can see can't you that these um, phrases are paralleled in both psalms which would give rise to a belief that there were originally one psalm. In terms of the type of psalm, Psalm 9 um, has thanksgiving, praise and prayer. Psalm 10 has lament, so crying out to God, um, petition and praise. And both psalms end with an appeal to God to demonstrate that man is only mortal. So in the end of Psalm 9, let the nations know they are but men. And at the end of Psalm 10, man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. So let's uh, look a little bit more closely um, at the focus in these two Psalms. One of the commentaries I read by a chap called Wilcock gave a, a very helpful picture of how it works. It said Psalm 9 and 10 work a bit like a diptych. Now, if you thought a diptych was that thing you stick in the oil in your car. Well, you're about to learn something new. A diptych is like a two-sided um, frame or, uh, well, I'll show you. Here we are. This is uh, my, this is for my pictures and it's actually got three on mine, but this is, this has two sides to it. It's hinged in the middle. So that would be, well, you're looking at it. It would be my left, but it's your right. So you've got a, a panel over here and a panel over there. And you'd find these in churches. Sometimes they'd be three, so they'd be a triptych. But, you know, you might have, say, the picture of the crucifixion over here and the picture of the um, the resurrection here. It's two sides of the same story, almost as though it's two sides of the same coin. And that's what we find with these two, two psalms. They work like a diptych. The left-hand side 
corresponds to the right hand side but brings out different aspects of it. Now I'm going to suggest that once again you press the pause button and again I will count to five on my fingers. It helps me to concentrate I suppose. Um, and what I want you to do when I've, um, uh, uh, while I'm doing that, it, you pause obviously, um, read through verses 1 to 12 in Psalm 9 and then read the first 11 verses in Psalm 10. So first of all, read the first 12 verses of, of Psalm 9 and then read the first 11 verses of Psalm 10. And I'll explain how they, although they appear very different, will parallel each other. So press the pause button now. OK, so if you've done that and you're joining us um, again, this is what we get here. Let's look at Psalms 9 and 10 as two sides, two sides of the panel, the diptych, if you like. In Psalm 9, we find that God is the judge and the king. And in Psalm 10, man is both predator um, and prey. So Psalm 9, verses 1 to 12, the focus is on God and the wicked are to be dismissed. And uh, here I, I'll... Um, Introduce you to the Hebrew letters. As I've said, there's 22 of them. And I'll mention which Hebrew letter is is uh, starting this particular uh, phrase. Uh, it, it's interesting, the, the Hebrew alphabet doesn't sort of have vowels in it. It does have an A at the start of the Aleph, but that's a silent one. Um, there's no F in the Hebrew um, alphabet until modern days. No J, W or K, but they have a TZ and an SH. Uh, as diphthongs there. So here we go. Psalm 9, 1 to 12, focus on God, the wicked to be dismissed. Aleph, I will praise you. Bet, you have upheld my cause. Gimel, you have rebuked the nations. Hey, the Lord reigns forever. Vav, the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. Zion, sing praises to the Lord. When you turn over then to Psalm 10, the focus is on the wicked. The previous psalm, the focus was on God. but And where that, whereas in Psalm 9, the wicked were dismissed, here God is dismissed by the wicked. So it starts with Lamed, the letter L. Why, O Lord, do you stand far off? And then you get a series of statements about the wicked man, introduced by the following letters, Nun, Samech, Pe, and Ayin, which are reversed. And there's no regular sort of pattern here, whereas in the other one, it's the start of um, each verse, each pair of verses. It breaks up, so there's a brokenness about this here, but they're all in there. So the wicked man hunts down the weak, boasts of the cravings of his heart, is proud and does not seek God, prospers and sneers at his enemies, tells himself he is safe, curses and lies and threatens, lies in wait for his victims. And then when we come to verse 10, you get the uh, Hebrew letter Tzadi. His victims are crushed. He tells himself that God does not see. And what you've got here in Psalm 9 is a positive statement. It's bright, but there are dark shadows in the background. Everything's fine, but there's, there's menace in the background. Psalm 10, it's a negative uh, psalm. But the darkness has bright gleams within it. It's a bit like if you were painting, it's kia oscuro, it's light and dark. Now let's deal with the second half of the two Psalms. We'll do the same again. I'll ask you to press pause, read through the second half of both Psalms, verses 13 to 20 and 12 to 18. And we'll pick it up again. Press pause now. OK, so we're back in again here. Psalm 9 verses 13 to 20 speaks of um, his enemies and God's sure justice, how things are. So, Het, O Lord, see how my enemies pursue me. Tet, the nations have fallen into the pit they have dug. Yod, the wicked return to the grave. Kof, is that cough, arise, O Lord, let the nations be judged. Psalm 10 verses 12 to 18 speaks of the wicked how things seem. They mock God and appear to get away with things. Cough, arise, O Lord, do not forget. Resh, you do see trouble, God. Sin or sheen, break the arm of the wicked. And Tav, the Lord is king forever. You hear the cry of the afflicted. Do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. 
So in closing, what do we learn? The psalmist moves from light to dark. Normally it moves from dark to light. It normally moves from a bad place to a good place. But the psalmist starts in Psalm 9 in a good place and comes into a bad place. But his experience in the good times sustains him in the dark times. And there's also this point of why do the wicked need to keep reassuring themselves that God does not see or punish? And this wickedness is of the worst sort. It's preying on the weak. It's preying on widows and orphans. Back in Deuteronomy, we read, you shall not pervert the justice due to the sojourner or to the fatherless or take a widow's garment in pledge. When you reap your harvest, um, you shall not go back to, to pick up a sheaf. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over them again. And when you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterwards. Leave it for the sojourner, the widow and, and the fatherless. And so we're left in this psalm with this lovely assurance right at the end, introduced by Tav. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline that your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you.